Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Praminder Raina, the lead principal investigator of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And thank you for joining us today. Um, I would like to begin today's webinar by acknowledging that as a national study, the CLSA is located on lands that are home to many diverse indigenous nations. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories and acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past as we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with indigenous peoples and communities in spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Uh, before we begin our uh, session today, I have a few housekeeping things to go through. Uh, today's presentation is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. Uh, closed captions are turned on. To change caption settings, select captions at the bottom of the Zoom window. If you have questions or comments, you can type them in the question and answer box at the bottom of the Zoom window. However, please note that questions submitted in advance uh, will be prioritized. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat box to inform our communication team. And finally, only the presenters audio and video will be enabled through the, throughout the webinar. Our agenda for today will include an update on the CLSA, followed by three presentations that highlight key CLSA findings and impacts of the study. As much as possible, our speakers have tried to incorporate the question you submitted into their presentations, but we had our work cut out for us. There were more than 500 questions submitted in advance, but our our presenters. Uh, first presenter will be Dr. Uh, Christina Wilson, is a professor in the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, Occupational Health and Department of Medicine at McGill University, and a senior scientist at Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center. And Dr. Wilson is also a principal investigator of the CLSA. She leads the Neurological Conditions Initiative and the Veterans Health Initiative. She is also the director of the CLSA Data Curation Center and a site principal investigator of the Montreal CLSA Data Collection Site. Our next speaker who will follow Dr. Wilson is Dr. Vanessa Taller. She is a professor in the School of Psychology at the University of Ottawa and a scientist at Breer Research Institute, where she serves as a site principal investigator for the CLSA. Her current research focuses on the impact of bilingualism on language and cognitive processing, development of neuropsychological testing material for detection of dementia, and changes in brain activity in cognitive impairment and dementia. Next speaker will be Dr. Verena Menek, is a professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences in the Max Reddy College of Medicine at the University of Manitoba. She's the inaugural site principal investigator of the Winnipeg, Winnipeg uh, data collection site for the CLSA. Her main research interests lie in the area of areas of healthy aging, determinants of healthy aging, social isolation and loneliness, and age-friendly communities. Our final speaker will be Dr. Brent Richards. He's a professor, William Dawson Scholar, and FRSQ clinician scientist. FRSQ is a uh, Quebec uh, health funding agency at McGill University and a senior lecturer at King's College, London, England, trained in genetics, clinical med medicine, endocrinology, epidemiology, and biostatistics. Dr. Richard focuses on understanding the genetic determinants of common age, aging-related endocrine diseases such as osteoporosis and diabetes. He's the co-lead of the CLSA Biomarker Working Group. And, uh, some of the, this, the, some of the faces you see on the screen are our uh, lead team that is uh, spread across the country. And what I'm going to do is to take a few minutes to introduce you to some of our other uh, investigators who are not part of the Manitoba, Ontario, and, and the Quebec. That's what we are targeting today. And, uh, and these are the people from our other sites, and we will be introducing them in. Uh, future webinars. And we also have some slides here that introduce many of our uh, coordinators across the country who you probably see all the time whenever you go and visit our sites. 
And these are the people who actually make this make study happen. Um, what I'm going to do is to go to the next slide and uh, talk about a little bit of the history of the CLSA. Um, in 2001, this was a long journey before we even started to engage uh, any one of you. 2001, there was a meeting that was held in Ottawa to think about designing a study of this nature. That was in, and we put in a grant application. We were fortunate to receive the funding. And then we had our first investment in from the federal government to launch this study in 2009. So you can see here for eight, almost eight, nine years, we were just developing this study to make sure that, that we will have a robust study as we uh, get ready to implement. 2010, uh, recruitment began. The baseline data collection began in 2011. Uh, CHR renewed our funding in 2015. So, and then we reached our recruitment goal uh, of the initial cohort in 2015 of 50,000 participants. Next slide, please. So you can see here 10 years of data collection uh, are happening in 2021. We are a couple of years uh, late uh, acknowledging that because of the pandemic. And our first data set for researchers to use was released in 2015. So our 10 years since the first data released uh, uh, it would be in 2025. So as a part of your engagement in the CLSA over the, uh, for the past 10 years, we really want to thank you for participating in this study and without your participation, your commitment, your dedication, we wouldn't have the data that we have collected to date and we intend to collect for another 10 years. I'm gonna pass on to Dr. Uh, Christina Wilson for uh, giving you an update about the CLSA. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for Parminder, Parminder for that uh, intro. I'm always a little bit shocked when I see that we started working together in 2001. And uh, here we are in, in 2023 uh, with the success of the study, largely due to our magnificent uh, participants. And I'm so glad that, that people are having the opportunity to be part of this webinar. So I wanna just take a minute. I've been tasked with talking a little bit about the nuts and bolts uh, of the study. And I hope I can explain a few things if, you're, if these are things that aren't clear. So we, we described the, the study and not, you must be familiar with us calling it the CLSA as both a research study and a platform. And some people say, well, what's the difference? Well, I think the difference is that in a research study, there's a very clear plan with specific questions that are targeted and then what we collect should relate to these specific questions. So we did that. We did that over those nine years when we were doing the planning. But what's a platform? Well, if you think about a diving platform, so you've probably all watched the Olympic games and you've seen people on the platform diving. Well, the CLSA is a platform in that sense. It's been built and then people can go up there and dive off using the data uh, that's collected in the CLSA to answer many, many different questions. So it's both a study and a platform. And when we talk about the platform, we're talking about allowing researchers, according to our very formal process uh, of review, to use these data both in Canada and around the world to answer research questions. So I wanted to just sort of uh, clarify the difference between a study and a platform. And we're both in the CLSA. Next slide. So there are a lot of institutions and you've been introduced to a few people on this call. This is really a national uh, collaboration. The institutions are very supportive uh, of the CLSA. Uh, so just, these are just the logos of the different institutions, both universities and research institutes that are involved. Next slide, please. So it's national in scope and I, I'm always quite intrigued when I see a map of Canada and I see that the cities are all squashed down towards uh, the border, but the cities that you see there are where we have the data collection sites across the country. The little blue dots uh, that you see are really uh, meant to refer to the telephone interviews. So we're able to do telephone interviews anywhere in the country, obviously, but we can only do the in-person assessments uh, from individuals who are living close to our data collection sites. But it's definitely a, a national study. Next slide, please. So 
I wish I, I don't really have a pointer, I don't think, at this uh, at this stage. So that's a little bit uh, of a challenge. But anyway, I'll just talk a little bit more about the platform. Things that you surely know from having read our uh, participant newsletters. We started out with over 50,000 participants at, at our at recruitment, and the individuals were aged between 45 and 85 at recruitment. Uh, there are a few questions that, and I went through all 500, uh, and one of the things I want to just tell people is that there are no, at this point, there are no new participants being recruited. Our recruitment ended in 2015, as, as Parminder mentioned, and so now this group of individuals are aging. Um, you are aging. I am aging as well as a researcher. And I just did a little uh, a little note on my piece of paper here. And I think our participants are now ranging in age from mid 50s to mid 90s, uh, which is really exciting for us that we're able to follow you over this extended period of time. And we're looking forward to another 10 years. So I have a big COVID uh, virus sitting in the middle. We all know that COVID happened and we all know that it did affect the way we were able to collect data in the CLSA. We pivoted very quickly to telephone interviews so that we could not only, of course, keep you as participants engaged in the study, but I think we're very proud to say that we were able to keep our staff engaged uh, by having them become uh, telephone interviewers, even though they, some of them weren't that uh, before. So I think this is uh, a testament to how we were able to pivot. And I do wanna say, because I want to uh, also address uh, several comments, several questions that came in, we are contacting participants. We are continuing to do in-home assessments but contacting some of you may be a little bit delayed uh, because of the pandemic, but we are looking forward to uh, welcome you all to the data collection site if you're participating in the comprehensive cohort or as part of the telephone interview if you're in the tracking cohort. So next slide, Laura. Okay, so there have been some enhancements uh, to this platform. Remember my diving platform analogy. And what we've been able to do is we've been able to, during the, the pandemic, we were able to add a questionnaire study and we were, had an amazing response from you with 28,000 uh, participants agreeing to participate in that. We were also able to launch a COVID antibody study during that time. Again, taking advantage, not only of you, of course, but also uh, of this platform to be able to get some real time information about a global uh, pandemic. In very recent years, we've added some other enhancements. We're doing a memory study. We also have a healthy brains and healthy aging initiative study. And we have seriously implemented our proxy questionnaire for those participants who can no longer participate on their own, uh, but need someone to help them. And there's that we also are had launched in 2021 a COVID brain health study. And I'm sorry, I don't have time to discuss uh, the details of each one of these right now, but just to say that we're building upon this platform as we move forward in time. Next slide, please. So I want to talk about uh, data collection. We have data collection on all of our participants through questionnaires where individuals, all of you are being asked to answer a large number of questions. And I have a little bit of a personal story uh, to tell you here. Hopefully it won't take too much time. In 2013, I got a telephone call from my mom and she said to me, I had a call from someone in Halifax and they said they wanted me to be part of a study. And I'm not gonna mimic my mother's Yorkshire accent, accent, but she did say to me, is this your study, love? So my mother, who's pictured here with my dad, was a participant in the tracking cohort. So I've seen both sides of the study. Um, she passed away last year, uh, but I also wanna say that I was her proxy, so um, would have been able to complete proxy interviews for her. So the tracking cohort is a very important uh, part uh, of the CLSA. What has been added new in this new follow-up, we've added some additional questions and we were able to release the tracking data a little bit earlier than the data from the comprehensive participants. And there's been a large number of publications and I know that our subsequent speakers are gonna talk about that uh, shortly. Next slide, please, Laura. So for the physical assessments, for those of you who come into our data collection sites and uh, battle, uh, parking and uh, travel time. 
There are, we, you all know that there are a lot of physical assessments that we're asking you to do. And we've added in this wave of data collection wearables. And there are a few subsequent slides about that. So that's what's been uh, added new. And of course we have cognitive assessments as well as the bio specimen collection, blood and urine. And this year we've added for a part, uh, for a part of the group uh, stool samples as well. So next slide. So just a minute to talk about the mobility trackers. I'm really impressed when I go into our data collection site and I see all these being set up and plugged in, uh, ready to hand off to the participants. So we've included a tick watch, a thigh actograph, uh, and this is being asked of all comprehensive participants. And I really appreciate those of you who've agreed to do this and have agreed to do this data collection uh, at home um, in between your in-home visit and your data collection site visit. So next slide. So we have the sleep trackers. I haven't tried this one out myself, but I know that the staff, the Montreal data collection site have. So this is a headband, uh, the Muse, and there's also a wrist actograph. And what we're doing here is tracking sleep quality and sleep patterns. And there'll be a, a subgroup of our comprehensive participants who are being asked to participate in this. So 2,360 out of the total number. Next slide. So just briefly speaking about one of the things on the previous slides that the Weston Healthy Brains and Healthy Aging Initiative, we were able to obtain funding from the Weston Family Foundation to add uh, MRIs, uh, magnetic resonance imaging studies and stool samples for this subgroup of comprehensive participants and then the stool samples only for 6,000 comprehensive participants. And again, I want to thank those of you who have agreed or have been asked and who have agreed to participate in this. For, for, and for some of the sites, I know you have to go somewhere else beyond the data collection site. So it's much appreciated that you're given this extra time to the CLSA. So next slide. This, this is a response to a number of your questions, and I think this is a really excellent question to ask. So what's happened to the 51,338 of you uh, that agreed to participate? Well, by the end of our second follow-up, uh, for just seven, a little over 7% of you had withdrawn from active data collection, although the vast majority consented to continue through data linkage. So this is really quite a small number for such a large study, given what we're, we're asking you to do. Just a little under 7% of participants have died since their baseline assessment. And um, this is one of the things that happened to me. I completed the decedent interview on for my mother and I, I, I felt that she really would have wanted me to complete her data collection for the CLSA. She was very proud of being a participant. And when I cleaned out her house, I had to remove the, the magnet from her fridge that she got from the CLSA. So we have, we have to think about ways to try and prevent losses. Um, and there were quite a few questions from people uh, about not being uh, contacted and I hope, hopefully you'll be contacted soon. We've added some questionnaires that can be done online for those of you who move outside of the area, if that's needed. And again, um, introducing the proxy questionnaire for a proxy who can actually answer the questions for a participant who for whatever reason uh, decides that they're not able to answer questions themselves. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of publications, scientific publications and reports that have come out um, of the CLSA using data researchers who are using these data. And this is just a slide to show you a few of those. There has been uh, publications on depression during uh, the pandemic about informal caregivers. We've had quite a few publications on vaccine willingness, just overall, not just COVID of course, but also influenza. And we've, uh, there are researchers who've always also looked uh, at the relationship between mild COVID and mobility problems. So you can see even just with these few examples, the scope of the data allows researchers to come in uh, to use the data in their own area of expertise and answer research questions that are of interest to them. And we do have a dashboard on the CLSA website that is interactive that you can go and take a look at that provides some of the COVID study results. Next slide, please. 
So these are the antibody, some antibody study findings. This has been another question that people ask. More than 18,000 people provided blood samples even during the pandemic. So we were very grateful to that. And we know that that was a hardship uh, for, for many of you. Uh, most of them were able to be tested and for the presence of antibodies that indicated infection. Many of the samples were collected before vaccines were available. So this was one of the main things that we looked at. And clearly the rates of positive uh, findings related to SARS-CoV-2 increased over time in all the provinces. Okay, so and younger participants were most likely to test positive, likely due to the fact that the, the older participants and people in Canada were probably staying away um, and isolating themselves a little bit more. And there are also results, additional results you can find on our website. Next slide, please, Laura. So how are these data being used? Next slide, please. So as I alluded before to researchers who are using these data, there are more than 500 research teams that have been approved to use the data since 2014. What's interesting, and I think this speaks well for the future of research and aging in Canada, more than a third are led by trainees. And I think um, that's really important. This is a way that trainees under the supervision of senior researchers can access these data and perhaps even make studies using the CLSA data part of their career uh, when they go into, uh, into their full jobs. Most of the projects are based in Canada, but we now have uh, research teams from the US, the UK, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Australia who have learned about the CLSA, appreciate its value, and who, have, who are now using and publishing uh, about uh, results related to aging. And there've been over 320 publications. And I should say that the CLSA does review each publication before it's submitted to a journal to ensure that the data have been used for the project that was approved, and also that the description of the study is accurate. Next slide, please. So these are just a few examples um, of the publications. So again, you'll see the variety publications on nutrition or and the development of high nutrition risk, publications on uh, age-friendly components of municipalities, successful aging and social participation, Gen genomic studies, genetic studies, season and daylight savings time on sleep symptoms. So it's just a vast, a uh, number of areas. And then uh, another paper that was recently published, these are all 2023 publications looking at persistent COVID symptoms uh, in community living older adults in, in the CLSA. And all of these publications are listed on our website and you should be able to access them uh, if you wish. Next slide, please. So we've got a lot of media coverage, which is very exciting. We don't do this to get into the media, but we really want our results to be uh, relayed in, in lay terms to the public. And we've had publications, here's Parminder uh, on, in the New York Times, and also we've had publications in the Globe and Mail. So we've had publications both in the English press and in the French press. So that's very exciting because I think the uptake from these kinds, this kind of coverage is, is often larger, of course, than scientific publications. So next slide, please. So there have been some uh, impacts on uh, policy. We are connected with the World Health Organization and the CLSA data have been used in a baseline report on the decade of healthy aging. So that was a very exciting initiative that we were contacted uh, knowing the importance of this study and of your contribution that the World Health Organization was interested in this. And we, we participated with the community COVID-19 uh, immunity task force that was set up during the pandemic in order to do our COVID studies, at least one of our COVID studies. And we worked very closely with the Public Health Agency of Canada, providing them with information. And sometimes they apply for data to do analyses of the data for policy reasons. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think if I'm not mistaken, that this is probably my, my last slide. We have to acknowledge the funding that has been received for this study. It is an ongoing uh, activity to ensure that we have adequate funding to be able to collect these data and to prepare these data for research and also to be able to 
find the time and resources to reach out to participants through development of our newsletters and the dashboards on the CLSA. Uh, so it's very important to acknowledge the funding. We're largely funded by the Government of Canada through the Can Canadian Institutes of Health Research, through the Canada Foundation for Innovation, and also provincial governments and the universities. The Weston Family Foundation, as I said before, has provided funding, COVID-19 Immunity Task Force, uh, the Jurabinsky Research Institute at McMaster University, and also the Nova Scotia uh, Health Research Coalition and the Public Health Agency of Canada. So I think if I'm not mistaken, Laura, who's leading us, this is my last slide, just saying thank you to all of you for participating. And if there are family members and friends on this call, thank you for supporting uh, the CLSA participants and thank you for, for being here. So I think I am now uh, charged with passing on the baton. I'm gonna look in the chat uh, now to see if I can answer some of the questions directly to you. But I'm gonna pass you on to Vanessa Tala, Dr. Vanessa Tala, who's going to talk to you about cognition in, in the CLSA. So over to you, Vanessa. Thank you very much, Tina. So I'm going to share my slides. Can everybody see that? I'm screen sharing. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for uh, for being here to uh, listen to uh, all this information about the CLSA. My uh, role in the CLSA, as Perminder mentioned, is that I'm the site uh, principal investigator at the at uh, the Ottawa site, and I'm also the um, the lead for the psychological health working group, which includes the cognitive data. So that is what I will be talking to you about here today. I'll talk to you a bit about what the cognitive data even are I, and give you a couple of examples of some of the work that's being published using these data and then go on to uh, talk to you a little bit about the uh, the follow-up studies with the current research that we're engaging in or analyses of the data. So I'd like to thank everyone for their, uh, we received, I received many questions about the, the cognitive data. The majority of the questions uh, relating to people had a lot of questions about cognitive impairment and dementia and uh, concerns about their memory and cognitive functions. So I will do my best to answer those questions for you as I go through the presentation. So let's uh, start, let me just, let's start by just telling you what I mean by the cognitive data. So I'm sure that uh, those of you who are participants are very familiar with the with these tests that I'm going to talk to you about quickly. So uh, everyone, there's a subset of tests that everybody in the CLSA does, uh, irrespective of whether you're in the tracking or the comprehensive cohort. And then we have some tests that we do only with the comprehensive cohort, just because we need people to be uh, present. With there are some that have materials that we uh, we need to do in person, you can't do over the telephone. So everybody does the animal fluency test. You'll remember this one where you are asked to name all the animals that you can think of in one minute. Uh, and in the comprehensive cohort, we also do that test, but using letters. So to name all the items that you can uh, think of in one minute with starting with a given letter. Everyone does the mental alternation test. So that's the one where you're switching between numbers and letters, 1A, 2B, et cetera. And uh, th those tests are assessing what we call your executive function. So these, uh, this is sort of like your, your brain's control center that you are uh, managing your resources and paying attention and so on. So uh, also for executive function, people in the comprehensive cohort uh, do a task called the Stroop task. So that is the one where you're asked to name. Um, so you see colors and you see color words, and then you see color words printed in a different color ink, and you have to name the color of the ink. So this is testing the ability to inhibit irrelevant information and, and name the color of the ink rather than reading the word. So we also, so that's executive function. We also have some tasks looking at memory function. So in both, uh, both cohorts, people do the auditory verbal learning test where you're given a word list, you're asked to remember it immediately and then at a five minute delay and also the prospect of memory test. So this is testing your ability to remember to remember. So uh, in real life, that looks something like, oh, I need to remember that I have to buy some milk on my way home from work or something along those lines. So in the way that we tested in the CLSA is by looking at 
uh, whether so that's the test where you have to remember at some point during the testing session to take the money out of the envelope and give it to the examiner uh, and you uh, you are either asked to do it at a certain time or with a queue. And then finally, we measure uh, processing speed. So that's the one with the computer screen where you're pressing, you're responding to items, and we're looking at how quickly you're able to do that. So these are the, the cognitive data that we collect. And we also ask people, so since follow-up one, we started asking people questions about their self-perceived memory function. So those are questions like, have you noticed any changes in your memory? Are you worried about those changes? And uh, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about that, uh, some work we've done using those data uh, in a few slides. So I'm gonna give you some examples. Now, I'll first, I'd like to say why we collect these data. So I know people don't, I, I hear that people don't like cognitive testing. I done lots of cognitive testing myself, and I also don't like it. So I certainly understand that and uh, very much appreciate people's willingness to do these tasks that they do not uh, do not enjoy doing. So why do we do this? Well, first, it allows us to track uh, changes in people's cognitive function over time. And we can look at the, um, the effects of different events or different health conditions on cognitive performance. So I'll give you an example of that in a moment. We can identify factors that might help people maintain cognitive function. And we can also track the progress of people who are worried if they're losing memory function, even if their memory testing is normal. So there, is, uh, there are people who will report, yes, my memory I feel like my memory is declining. And then when we look at their memory performance, actually they are they look fine. So this is a really interesting uh, question of what does that mean for somebody to have the self-reported concern about their memory or cognitive function in the pre in, in the context of normal cognitive performance. So uh, I'm going to highlight now a couple of, there's many studies using the cognitive data. I certainly don't have time to talk about all of them, but I wanted to highlight a, a couple of uh, studies that have been done using these data. So this one that I'm going to talk about now about tra traumatic brain injury is some work done by my former PhD student, Mark Bedard. So he, he based his PhD work on CLSA data, and he was interested in traumatic brain injury and cognition. So traumatic brain injury is when somebody suffers a, a head injury that results in injury to the brain, and uh, often people will refer to a concussion, which is a, a, a TBI. And so in CLSA, we ask people if they have experienced TBIs in the past, and what he wanted to do was look at performance and cognitive testing in people who've had a, a head injury, uh, both initially and then after three years. So in his thesis, he looked at the data from the from baseline and from follow-up one. And so some people who, who experience a TBI uh, experience also loss of consciousness, some do not. So he was also looking at that as a factor to assess the severity of the TBI. So he wanted to look at their cognitive performance and he was also interested in the role of social support as a predictor of preserved cognitive function. So there have been some studies suggesting that social support is very uh, valuable in terms of preserving cognitive function. It's quite unique to be able to do this kind of study with such a large, a group of participants and see if social support can help people maintain their cognitive function in the face of a challenge like a TBI. So what he found was that people with a previous TBI at some point in the past who had experienced a loss of consciousness with that TBI had lower cognitive performance and greater cognitive decline. And this is even years after the TBI. So in, within CLSA, we ask about lifetime uh, traumatic brain injury. It, it doesn't uh, have to be recent. So uh, this is as expected. The, a brain injury will uh, have impacts on people's cognitive function. But what was really exciting about this, his findings was that when uh, he asked people about their perceived social support that it suggests that he found that 
uh, perceived social support can help buffer against this cognitive decline. So what that means is if somebody reports that they have high levels of social support, they show less decline over the course of these three years compared to people reporting lower levels of social support. And this is there's different types of social support. So CLSA asks about different uh, different subsets of social support. And what he found was that specifically or particularly emotional support seem to help buffer against cognitive decline. So this is really uh, exciting because it suggests avenues for helping people preserve their cognitive function, uh, even in the face of challenges like a traumatic brain injury. So and I mentioned previously uh, subjective cognitive status. So we know that there are some people that report that they're worried about changes in their memory or cognition, even though their performance on cognitive tasks is normal. So you'll notice, and we ask if you've noticed changes, and we also ask if you're worried about them. So uh, a lot of people, the, over 50% of people report that they uh, have noticed changes, which uh, is, is uh uh, understandable. I would say that I feel like I've noticed changes in my cognitive function in, in the past uh, few years. My memory is not as high as it was when I was 25, but the, critically, we also ask people if they are concerned about um, about those changes. So when we're talking about people who have what we call subjective cognitive decline, what we mean is people who say they are concerned, they say their their memory has changed, they say that they're concerned about it, and then when we test them, their performance on cognitive tasks is normal. So of course, people whose cognition is declining or who have cognitive impairment also often report that they're concerned about, about their cognitive, about their memory performance, but here we're focusing on the people who don't show any signs of cognitive cognitive impairment. So a critical question in research is what does this mean? Is it that the person is starting to decline, but the changes are too subtle and are not detectable yet with uh, with neuropsychological testing? Or it could be that the person is fine and they're just experiencing anxiety or concerns, but so this we would call the, the worried well. And, and so Typically, when you look at people with subjective cognitive decline, there is a subset who are the worried well, and there's a subset who are what we would say in a stage where the patient knows, but the doctor doesn't know yet that there's something wrong. So we, uh, one of the major goals in research is to figure out who of those people are uh, on a trajectory to start experiencing cognitive impairment and who are not. So we've uh, we've started asking people, as I said, in, in the second wave of data collection about their self-perceived cognitive function so we can start to answer these questions. So uh, this is another uh, a more work done by a PhD student uh, here at, at, who was here at University of Ottawa at the time she was doing this work. And uh, the, the question was that she was trying to identify the biopsychosocial factors that predict these concerns about cognition. So why do we want to do this? Well, understanding the factors that predict uh, concerns about cognition could help us design interventions to assist people with these, uh, with these concerns. So what she found was that physical factors, surprisingly physical factors such as phys uh, low levels of physical activity, hypertension, problems with vision, did not predict concerns about cognition. But really what was driving these effects were as psycho, um, psychosocial variables. Um, so depression, uh, perceived, uh, perceived support, and personality traits. So for example, people who are uh, more uh, extroverted are less likely to have concerns. People who are more emotionally stable are less likely to have concerns. People who are very conscientious, this is a, a, again, um, reducing the risk of, of concerns. So why uh, why is this important? Well, when we when you're thinking about conceptualizing subjective cognitive concerns, it is really important to consider psychological and social factors. So this can be relevant both in terms of building theory about what it means to have SCD or subjective cognitive decline, and also from a kind of clinical perspective when you're assessing someone uh, determining uh, how to uh, how to think about their self-reported memory concerns. 
So what we're doing now is I, we're trying to identify factors that influence the risk of subsequent decline in people with these subjective cognitive concerns, and also examining factors like perhaps social support that might protect against cognitive decline. So this really actually addresses a lot of the questions that I, I received um, about what is it that we can do uh, to help us, I'm concerned, people say, I'm concerned about my memory. Is there anything I can do to prevent myself from uh, or reduce my risk of, of developing cognitive impairment? So these are some of the, the questions that we're trying to answer now. There were, we were limited in our ability to really study dementia in the early years of uh, CLSA because people at baseline, when they entered the study, everybody uh, was cognitively intact. So what that means is that as uh, the study progresses, we are going to see some of our participants uh, developing cognitive impairment and dementia. And now really is when we're starting to uh, be able to do more research looking at that population. <clears throat> so uh, there's this just a couple, a little flavor of some of the, the work that's been done so far with the, the cognitive measures. Uh, we have lots of other uh, ongoing work. So in collaboration with uh, my colleague, Megan O'Connell uh, at the University of Saskatoon, she's developed a method to detect changes in cognition using the CLSA battery. So she's developed something that, she, that we refer to as the cognitive impairment indicator, which uses the uh, scores that we have available from the cognitive testing to identify people who might be at risk of having cognitive impairment. So this is important because, you know, sometimes somebody will get a low score. You can't interpret a single low score as indicating cognitive impairment. So I'm sure you all know this from having done uh, lots of uh, lots of cognitive testing. Sometimes you just there's a test that you don't do well on for for whatever reason. Maybe you're distracted or uh, your brain kind of freezes and you don't, for example, produce very many items when you're asked to name all the animals that you can. But actually, all the other neuropsych scores or the cognitive scores look fine. So this is what we would call a spurious uh, low score. So using this cognitive impairment indicator allows uh, allows us not only to identify cognitive impairment within CLSA, but also identify baseline, like how many people show these types of spurious scores, which can be very helpful for, for clinicians when they're uh, when they're working with clients uh, in the in the clinic. So, and we can also use, so a recent uh, study that was just published uh, was looking at shift work as, so this is using this cognitive impairment indicator and identified that shift work is a risk factor for people exhibiting uh, or being at risk for cognitive impairment. So this is, uh, there's a lot of uh, a huge possibilities of all of the factors that we can consider as uh, potential risks for, for cognitive impairment. And this work is, is just beginning. So this is a paper that came out in just in 2023, uh, showing risks of shift work, which of course disrupts uh, sleep and, and circadian rhythm. So it's uh, uh, not good for cognition. Uh, Another really important piece of work that the, we've done as part of the cognitive group with Megan and others is developing norms based on this very large sample. So what do I mean by norms? Well, this is uh, where, so when you are seeing a clinician and they do cognitive testing on you, they need to know what a normal score would look like or what they would expect your score to look like based on factors like age, education level, sex, and so on. So we they will use norms to do that, to determine if somebody looks like they're outside of normal limits on, a, on performance on a cognitive test. But oftentimes the, the number of participants used to develop these norms is a little bit low. So uh, this the CLSA provides a really exciting opportunity to develop very robust norms based on this uh, very large sample. And so this is because we know that cognition is expected to change as we age. There are some uh, areas of cognition where you'll see changes. We call this normal aging. So we're trying to determine when people's cognitive performance changes, if this is normal aging or if there's a cause for concern. And excitingly, the norms are available in both English and French because many people complete their, their uh, CLSA visits in French. So this is uh, really uh, um, useful for clinicians across uh, across. Canada. Uh, 
We are also looking to identify markers of cognitive decline, and this will, uh, uh, in the future, will allow us to identify risk and protective factors for dementia. And we're also doing work, so Tina mentioned uh, the international nature of work with CLSA. So a study we recently published, Harmonizing. So there are lots of studies in other countries with uh, large scale studies with older adults. And we harmonized across those studies to determine the optimal way to ask people. So this was related to the questions on subjective cognitive status to identify the optimal way to ask people about their cognitive function. So, because there's lots of different ways that you can do this and like you how's your function compared to other people your age compared to yourself 10 years ago are you concerned about it etc so we've been able to use all of these data sets to uh, to combine and, and figure out how those questions should best be posed uh, so in conclusion, the cognitive data are a com crucial component of the CLSA. We're so grateful that you complete these tests. They allow us to understand the factors driving cognitive health throughout the lifespan. Uh, this can help us assist people in maintaining cognitive health and also identify people who are at risk of cognitive decline. And our ultimate goal is to lead to better quality of life uh, for Canadians and others as well, of course. So. Uh, that's my uh, my final slides. Thank you very much for your participation and also for coming here today to listen to us. And I'm now going to pass off to uh, Verena Menek, who'll be talking to you about social isolation. Thanks, Vanessa. Hello, everybody. I'm assuming if I, uh, people can't hear me, they will let me know. I'm going to share my slides here. All right. Oh, let me go back. Yes, I am really pleased that I uh, am able to share some of the work I've been doing on social isolation and loneliness. And let me introduce, first of all, my colleague here, Nancy Newall. She's an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Brandon University. So the two of us have been working on this topic oh, for quite a few years now, uh, probably well over 10 years in some form or the other, and uh, we'll keep going with it. Um, starting off with some definitions, uh, just so we're all on the same page, what do I mean by social isolation and loneliness? Imagine we have two people, and I call them here Lizzie and Tom, and the circles around those two people reflect their social networks. So the squares within the circles are the people in the social network. The people within the small circle are the people that are really the person feels, sees a lot, is close to the outer circle, are also important people in the person's life, and the different colors reflect different people, for example, red is for the partner or spouse, and the blue is for children, grandchildren. And so we, we, we carry these networks through life with us. Um, now, when you look at the two networks, they're very, really, very different. So Lizzie has a lot of people in her social network. Uh, Tom has very few. So probably we could uh, argue, uh, you might agree with me that Lizzie might not be socially isolated because she does have a lot of people around her that she, let's say we've asked her, that she sees a lot, she has a lot of contact with, um, versus Tom does not. So social isolation then is an objective state of a lack of social contact. It's something we can count. We can count the number of people in the network. We can ask about frequency of contact, and we can say that Lizzie, let's say, is not socially isolated where, where Tom is. Loneliness, on the other hand, is a feeling. It is an unpleasant feeling of being disconnected, of not having the enough contact, not the type of contact that one would like. So looking at Tom, not a lot of people in the social network, really, we could say socially isolated. We don't know whether he's lonely. Maybe he's actually not lonely at, at all. Maybe he's just happy with having very few uh, people in the network. Lizzie, on the other hand, even though she has a lot of people in her social network, might actually be lonely. We would have to ask her. Uh, the saying, as the saying goes, we can be lonely in a crowd. 
Now, we know from a lot of research for many decades, over many decades, that social isolation and loneliness, both of them are health risks. And here are just a few examples. They're um, associated with the decreased immune system, increased risk of heart disease and stroke, increased risk of dementia, uh, increased risk of depression. Loneliness in particular is very strongly related to depression and lower quality of life. We also know that uh, social isolation is related to mortality, so it increases the risk of mortality as much as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Now, that statistic, that uh, piece of information, has been quite a bit in the media uh, during the pandemic especially, even though we have known this for over 40 years since the early 80s, so it's not a new finding at all. So we know social isolation and loneliness are bad. We've known that for a very long time. The real challenge though is how do we connect people? What do we do about it? And that is where uh, our work, Nancy and my work has focused on. So how can we get that socially isolated, socially or lonely person socially engaged uh, and, and connected to the very many programs that are actually available out there that, uh, that, are, that, that could provide some social uh, contact. So our project, which we're calling Targeting Isolation, has two main objectives. One is to provide evidence-based information about social isolation, loneliness, but also about other aspects of, of uh, aging, about older adults, and then train community connectors to identify and refer at-risk older adults to resources in the community. Now, what do I mean by community connectors? A community connector is a person in the community who as part of their everyday work it, um, is in contact with older adults who might be socially isolated or lonely. So think about a pharmacist. Pharmacists have a lot of contact with a lot of people and they might actually be an older person's only contact as they pick up medication. So that might be a person who could say, well, wait a minute, there seems to be something wrong here. This person maybe is chatting a little bit too much. What's going on? I'm not sure. And so that person then, that pharmacist, that community connector could say, again, there's warning signs here. I'm not sure what to do. This is not really my job, right? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a pharmacist, I'm not a counselor. And then they would refer that person over to a community organization who could assess needs and then connect the person with the appropriate resources. Now we can't do this project alone. So we are partnering with community organizations uh, that is uh, forming uh, what we call the Aging Well Together Coalition. And let me just briefly introduce the organizations. Activating, active Aging in Manitoba is an organization that focuses on active living, healthy aging. Uh, the Manitoba Association of Senior Communities focuses also on social engagement. It's an umbrella organization that uh, helps uh, active living uh, centers and seniors groups uh, with their programming. Uh, we have the Transportation Option Network for seniors, TONS, uh, that focuses, as the name suggests, on transportation. Transportation is a really important piece of this whole puzzle because what if there are programs out there in the community, but the person can't get to them? then they're stuck. So we need to also work on transportation. And then we have a &O support services for older adults, and they provide specialized support services for older people. Uh, just to give a couple of examples, they have a really interesting um, program called Senior Centers Without Walls. It is programming for socially isolated older adults over the phone. So all kinds of things uh, that people can uh, call in and, and have programming over the phone. Uh, they also have a befriending program. So, so a volunteer will, will go into a person's home to, to chat with them and just for some friendly visiting. And overall, we also uh, try to raise awareness of the issue of social engagement, the importance of social engagement and as well as programs and so on. So that's 
us. Now, targeting isolation. So that's the work that Nancy and I do, um, is very much based on CLSA. So CLSA provides a foundation for our work. And why is CLSA so important for us? Well, first of all, it's Canadian data, and that's super important. Uh, but in some cases, given what we're interested in, some of the basic statistics that we're interested in, we can also have Manitoba-specific data. And for our partner, that's partners, that's really important because they know what's going on right here in Manitoba. And some of it, we can even look at Winnipeg. You know, what's happening here? What does the picture of social isolation loneliness look like right here? Um, CLSA also has a lot of questions on it. And, and, and thanks so much for responding to all of the questions that we ask you. But there are questions around social networks, social support, social participation. All of those are really important for us and loneliness, of course. Uh, in terms of our work, those are really, really important. So let me give you just a flavor of, of some of the things that is important for our partners. So just to know how common are social isolation and loneliness in Manitoba. Um, by the way, these numbers will not be that different in other uh, localities, in other provinces. But again, for our partners, it's particularly important to you know, have the Manitoba figures. So about 20% uh, uh, of Manitobans age 65 plus are socially isolated. About 25% say they are lonely, and this is pre-COVID, and about one in three, so about 30%, uh, something like that, want to participate in more social activities. That last uh, piece of information is, is important, again, for our partners, because it suggests that people actually do want to be more socially engaged. There's, a, there's an opportunity there uh, if we only could uh, get them hooked up. Now, we know life changed during COVID. We all know that we have gone through it. And uh, I think all of us have to some extent, did to some extent become socially isolated. Many of us became lonely and CLSA has been, as was pointed out by Tina, has been incredibly useful to show what just the magnitude of that impact was. And so when we look at Manitoba figures, uh, Again, pre-COVID, we have about 20% socially isolated people, and then it goes to about a third, 30% uh, plus during COVID. Now, in and of itself, that doesn't surprise us because we all know that it was a real challenge to live through COVID. What is interesting, though, is how this will change over time as we get new data in. So as, we, as you are willing to participate again in being interviewed, how do the numbers change? Are people recovering from COVID? And perhaps even more importantly, are there certain groups of people who do not go back to normal? And that we need to know about, and that the organizations that we're working with need to know about where are the gaps, where are the challenges? We've also done research on uh, risk factors. So, um, both our research and other people's research shows that uh, um, social isolation loneliness is more common among people living on low income, those with health problems, those experiencing life transition and uh, losing a spouse, a partner is a very major impact, for example. So in order to, to group the, these, these risk factors, we've come up with the acronym HELPS, so knowing the risk factors helps. And we've, came up, we've come up with that just as a way of helping those community connectors remember some of these risk factors. And so, so again, briefly, they are health problems. Environmental factors would include things like uh, having access to transportation, uh, living in a, in a safe neighborhood, um, life transitions, again, I mentioned uh, loss of a spouse, but there are other life transitions that are really important, uh, like becoming a caregiver can be very isolating. Uh, losing a driver's license can make a big difference. There are psychological risk factors, for example, lower self-esteem, and some people have certain negative ways about thinking about their relationships, even if they have relationships, and that can be detrimental. 
And then we have certain social groups like, uh, uh, for example, people on low income who are more likely to be socially isolated or lonely. Another thing we have been working on a great deal is to say, how can we, how can we tell our community connectors who they should refer to a community organization? So yes, risk factors are important to know about, but not everybody who has a risk factor will be socially isolated and lonely. So can we be more specific? And we have done, Nancy and I, quite a lot of research using CLSA on that, but also combined with other people's research, we have once again come up with a, an acronym, show somebody you cared. So let's say you see somebody that you think has some of those risk factors. Maybe there's some, some warning signs, there's some signals, something is not right here. What is it that you should look out for? The C stands for connections. That relates to the loneliness. Does the person want more social contact? Are they lonely? You might not want to directly ask them if they're lonely, but you could ask, would you like to be around more people? Activities. Does the person lack meaningful activities? And the question here might be, what do you do for fun? Would you like to do other things? other than what you're currently doing. Relationships, uh, get at social isolation. How much contact does the person have with friends, family? So uh, how often do you see your family or friends, might the family members might be a question here. Does the person have an emergency contact? So are there social supports there if they're needed? And dwelling, is, uh, are they living alone? Are they living in a safe neighborhood? Now, I wanted to just address a question that uh, somebody uh, sent our way, uh, and that has to do with living alone. And the question was, is living alone different from being living with a spouse? And my answer would be, it depends. We have it here as one of the questions to explore, but in and of itself, living alone does not need to be a problem, depending on the social network that the person has around them. So a person can live alone, but be very strongly socially connected and have social supports, right? They have, might have people who check in every day on them. They might go out a lot. They, so there's a very strong social network. Where there is a problem is when a person lives alone and has no good social network and social support system. So think about what would happen if the person falls. Would somebody notice? Or as we've seen uh, some, in some recent um, uh, disasters, natural disasters like heat waves, there were all the people living alone and nobody knew, nobody realized that they were in danger and some of people died. So living alone is not the only thing of course, it depends really on other factors, the social support and social network around them. So what we tell our community connectors then, if, if you see some of these signs, the person seems to be lacking the connections, if three or more questions are, are causing you concern, refer the person over to a community um, organization. So we have, uh, in targeting isolation then, we have prepared fact sheets. So everything I talked about is on our website. You can access it there. It has more information than I could go through. We have reports. Uh, we have resources, various resources. We also have videos. We, you can meet Tima, targeting isolation Manitoba, who will talk you through some of the things I've talked about, like risk factors, so on, so on, so on. Uh, just to note that because we're working in Manitoba, our some of the stats, uh, the facts are Manitoba specific. So just be aware of that if you're accessing the website from outside. Some of it is general, but some of it will be Manitoba specific. 
Now to train community connectors, we've also developed workshops. So Nancy and I have given workshops. We've given them for, for example, pharmacists, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, and so on. But we've also developed e-learning modules. Again, they're accessible. If you're interested in looking at that, you can look at them. One is for healthcare professionals like pharmacists, and one is for community volunteers. And again, goes through what is social isolation, what are some of the risk factors, what are some of those uh, signs. And then there's the referral information. Now, the caveat with this is that it is Manitoba focused. We are telling community connectors in Manitoba to refer over to a &O support services for older adults, the organization that we're partnering. Why a &O? Well, because they're a partner of ours, but also because they have the capacity to call back the person when they're refer, getting a, refer, a referral. So when they get a referral, they can call the person, they have the capacity to assess needs, and they can then uh, uh, get the person in touch with whatever uh, resources the person actually needs. So if you're looking at it from outside, I would encourage it, outside Manitoba, I would encourage you to think about which organization would you refer somebody to? Is there an organization in your community that might make a lot of sense? So that's it for me. Um, thank you so much for participating in CLSA. Our work would not be possible without you. And for any of the information I talked about or other information, go to targetingisolation.com or you can contact me directly. And I will turn it over to Brent. And uh, we can share with you biological samples information. Hello, everybody. Um, very nice to be able to present to the CLSA participants. Um, I want to start off by expressing my gratitude for all of the work that has been done by CLSA participants um, to participate in this cohort. And I have been working um, as a researcher interested in the genetic determinants of disease and have been working with CLSA data for uh, at least about the last eight years. And I'm just going to share with you some of the insights that we've been able to make and try to provide this into a context which may be relevant to uh, most of the participants on this call. Um, so I'm going to start off by um, maybe bringing some of you back to 1978, when in June, 30 boys went on a canoe trip in Lake Temiskaming, and 12 of them died. And one of the adults on the trip also died. And this was a tragedy at the time in Canada, and in fact, was um, brought to a uh, provincial commission. And Within this context, a thorough examination as to the causes of this tragedy uh, was brought to fore. And when people think about tragedies, they often think, well, this person swerved left into my lane in front of me, or this critical decision was made that led to the death of these 12 boys. But what the commission actually found when they examined the causes of this tragedy is that there was no actual single cause of this tragedy. Rather, it was a confluence of risk factors. And that was that these were inexperienced paddlers. They were in a moderate wind. There were moderate waves. Notice that these were not severe waves. These were moderate waves. They were paddling for four hours, so not a long period of time. They didn't sleep very well. There was cold water, there was no swim test, and there was only one adult. And this confluence of risk factors led to a tragedy, um, which actually changed the shape of outdoor education in Ontario and across Canada, and changed how people think about um, participating in outdoor activities, because it became apparent that this was not just unique to this tragedy, but actually was a common theme in many tragedies across Canada. And I'm going to share with you how a similar analogy can be made to actually risk of disease. 
And I'm going to talk, start off by talking about breast cancer. I'm going to talk about it because it's common. Um, almost everybody on the call will have known somebody in their life who's, who has been impacted by breast cancer or maybe been a breast cancer survivor themselves. And when we think about what causes breast cancer, um, a lot of people tend to think about a specific cause. And in fact, um, there's a, a very well-known example of a, a woman who had a single genetic cause, which led to her having a double mastectomy to prevent um, occurrence of breast cancer. But when we think about most people who have breast cancer, we find that they actually do not have a single genetic cause, but actually they do, they have a confluence of many causes. And so I'm going to take you through a little bit of a story today to tell you a little bit about how we have begun to think more and more about the major causes of diseases in our population and how these are actually a confluence and mix of causes. Because most aging, aging related diseases caused by hundreds of little nudges. And some of those little nudges are the things that we eat, the number of times we go for a run, the number of cigarettes that we smoke. But a, a lot of that risk, and this varies by disease, but a lot of that risk is actually inherited as little tiny nudges from our parents in the form of our genome. And what I'm going to do is take you through a um, graphical demonstration of how we've been able to try to discern these little nudges over time and how we peer into the genome to be able to do so and what this means to you and your families. So this is a map of the human genome. Each of these vertical lines is actually a chromosome. And this is um, the state of knowledge in 2005 where each one of these little pins represents a region of the human genome that was reproducibly associated with the risk of disease and you can and risk of common disease. And you can see that back in 2005, which you know, was around the time CLSA was getting started, we knew very, very little. Um, and then if we fast forward to 2020, excuse me, 2010, this map becomes much more dense. We start to see many more pins show up where we're reproducibly associating uh, different regions of the genome with risk of common diseases. And if we move to 2020, this becomes very, very, very full. And in fact, I'm actually only able to show you some of the chromosomes because if I had to show you all of them, they wouldn't fit into one slide. And so how has this happened? Well, it's happened via the work that people like you have done which is sharing your DNA as well as medical information so that we can map the regions of the genome that cause common diseases. And we have been able to understand that just like in the case of the um, Lake Temiskaming tragedy, as well as most causes of breast cancer, that our risk of disease is predominantly conferred from a genetic perspective by tiny little nudges from many thousands of genetic variants that impact our risk. And now with that as an understanding, I'm going to move forward to try to explain to you how we can use this information to help our patients. And I'm gonna frame this in three different categories. The first is how we can use this information for disease prediction, how we can use it for improving diagnoses, and the third, how we can use this information to identify causes of disease. So let's get started and talk about disease prediction. Okay, so we'll focus on breast cancer. And this is a very interesting slide. I was published a, a few years ago now, and things have actually improved since then in our ability to be able to discern those at risk of breast cancer. And what the, um, the horizontal axis shows here is the age of a woman. And what on the y-axis shows here is their absolute risk of getting breast cancer. Most people do not contract breast cancer over their lifetime. Um, but what these different colored lines do is they summarize the information across the genome and what's called a polygenic risk score to be able to put people on different tracks for different absolute risks of uh, having breast cancer. And you can see that if you're in the 99th percentile of risk, 
So it'd be a very, very high risk and your risk would be higher than 99% of the population. That your risk of breast cancer starts to become appreciably high even in your late 30s and becomes very high by the age of 80. Whereas if you're in the bottom one percentile of risk, this actually, your risk actually never becomes appreciably high where in most jurisdictions would suggest a mammogram until quite later in your life. And most people, of course, are binned into different groups uh, depending upon their, their risk. But what we can actually now do is quantify this risk through something called a polygenic risk score, which is just a fancy way of saying, of counting all of those little nudges that we have in their genome and seeing who is lucky enough to have very few and who is unlucky enough to have many. And so you can easily think about this as a shared cumulative risk that that person has just by collecting all of those little nudges that moves them along this risk distribution. And what we can start to think about doing for these people is instead of just identifying people like Angelina Jolie, who are at risk for a single mutation, which increases importantly the risk of breast cancer, but identifying the very, very large proportion of the population in compared to those with a single gene mutation, who actually have a similar or higher risk of disease, but is much more common in the population because they're, they happen to be in the top 5% or the top 1% of the risk uh, accumulation. And so I'll next talk about how we can use this information to try to improve diagnoses. And I'm going to shift to using genetic insights in the case of diabetes. I'm gonna show you an example of how we can actually use uh, the same type of polygenic risk score to differentiate between type one and type two diabetes. And why is this a problem? Well, many of you may know someone who has diabetes and you probably know more people who have type two diabetes. Type two diabetes is a disease that is often later onset in age and is often more driven by obesity. But about half of the people who develop type 1 diabetes actually develop it in, after the age of 18. And so I'm an endocrinologist. I treat people with diabetes all the time. And very early in their disease, it's very difficult to try to understand which type of diabetes they have. But interestingly, these two different diseases, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, have very different genetic risk factors. And so we can actually quantify a person's risk of the disease, both type one and type two diabetes, and see if they are someone who, who more clearly has genetic predisposition to one type of diabetes over the other. And doing so can really help us to rationalize when the patient should begin on insulin therapy. And so here is a slide where um, researchers have done this. They have done this by um, looking at two genetic risk profiles, one for people with type 1 diabetes and the other for type 2 diabetes. And you can see that you can spread out these two populations quite nicely where some people overlap, but the majority you can actually paint them into more probably a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes or more probably a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. And this information I'm actually rolling out into our clinic right now at McGill University in Montreal to help clinicians and their patients decide which type of diabetes they have so that they can receive the appropriate therapies faster. The third thing that I promised to tell you about was identifying causes of disease. And this is a way that we can uh, use human genetic information to be able to disentangle a lot of the causes and consequences of disease um, using um, some simple concepts that I'll describe to you right now. So oftentimes we're trying to understand whether or not a risk factor causes a disease. And here I'm gonna switch gears to talk about osteoporosis. I'm actually gonna use data from you to be able to show you these insights. We can measure a risk factor for a disease and we can measure these in bloods. And one thing that we have recently measured in approximately 10,000 people in CLSA is 1,000 different metabolites. And so some people on this call 
your blood has been surveyed for 1,000 circulating metabolites. And we're interested if any of these cause aging-related diseases, and I'm just gonna show you the example of osteoporosis. So when we do that, when we measure these metabolites and test if they're associated with osteoporosis, we should be really worried about confounders. And confounders could be things like body mass index, so having a high body mass index could influence a metabolite and could increase uh, or decrease your risk of osteoporosis. And if we don't understand this relationship and this potential confounding factor, then we can draw spurious conclusions and doing so actually plagues a lot of our understanding of cause and consequences of disease. And so using the human genetic data that we've generated from your DNA, we can actually disentangle this problem by identifying genetic variation. So some people have one flavor of a piece of DNA and other people have a different flavor of a piece of DNA that strongly associates with metabolites. And what we can then do is using the biological fact that these genetic variants are randomized in the population at conception. So whether or not you got a specific genetic variant or your brother or sister got a specific genetic variant is essentially a random process. And that random process breaks association with confounding factors. And doing so allows us to um, be able to test via these genetic variants, their effect upon disease, freeing ourselves of these confounding factors. And so we've done this recently using data generously contributed by participants on this call. And we were able to estimate the causal effects of uh, 1,000 metabolites on bone density, which many of you will know is um, the most important risk factor for osteoporosis. And we found that some of the metabolites had clear effects upon uh, bone mineral density, um, such as all this metabolite here, which I'll name, which is called orotate, which has um, found that individuals who had higher levels of orotate had much lower bone mineral density. Um, and importantly, we can make a statement that orotate influences bone mineral density causally and is unlikely to be biased by confounding. And this information can be very, very helpful for therapeutic development because we can actually identify targets that are causal in humans, which is a difficult thing to do across the entire biomedical enterprise of information because it's very rare that we can actually make causal insights in humans. And therefore, being able to target something that actually causes the disease um, is much more effective than something that is actually just associated with the disease or something that is actually caused by the disease. And so this is an example of how we've used your data um, to be able to gain causal insights in disease, providing us a platform for, be, for being able to undertake therapeutic interventions that intervene upon these metabolites and decrease risk of disease or its consequences. So um, I'll just summarize here. The first point that I'd like to make is that rapid advances in measuring millions of small influence on disease risk has allowed us to better identify individuals at risk of disease, clarify diagnoses, and help to identify causes of disease, which can be used as targets for therapeutic interventions. This is only possible through large scale collections of data from humans such as you, the participants of CLSA, and for which we are very grateful. I'll close by just reminding you that, in fact, most tragedies that affect our lives are due to a confluence of causes. And this is something that we're beginning to be able to quantify quite clearly using large scale human um, collections such as those afforded by DNA. And I, by the DNA in CLSA, and I look forward to answering any questions that you have and, and discussing in the Q&A session. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brent, and thanks to all of our presenters and attendees for joining us today. Uh, before we close, I just wanted to share a few reminders. If you have questions 
about your participation or wish to update your contact information, please get in touch with us by phone, email, or through our website. You can always visit the CLSA website uh, for the latest news about updates about the study and all the new publications that are coming out and you saw some of the highlights today. And we'll also appreciate you completing the feedback survey because this is important because we want to engage with you, but we want to make sure that we are giving you information that is of interest to you and you see the value of participating in a study like CLSA. Um, all registered attendees will be emailed a link to the survey in the next 24 hours, so please fill it out. And finally, I thank you again uh, for participating in the CLSA, your contribution, and something Dr. Wilson mentioned at the beginning of the study, which is really important uh, for a study like CLSA, that, uh, that uh, uh, we have as high a retention as possible, because that's what makes these uh, findings uh, applicable to a, a general population. In relation to that, there were some questions posted on the on the chat and on the question answer, how representative this study is. And the question was, because we only focused on 10 provinces and we didn't go into the territories. And uh, I think Dr. Wilson did answer that question. And, uh, but we use the Statistics Canada sampling technique. That's how we identify people. And the challenge is that, and other fact is that we did not go on to the uh, reserves to recruit people into the study because it requires a very different type of study. You have to work with the communities. And we early on determined that if that type of a study was going to happen, it will have to be led by people who are from those communities. And, and the, the challenges of other parts of the remote areas in Canada was that there was hardly any infrastructure available to carry out a study like this. So it was a, a logistical decision rather than a scientific decision. Uh, however, what we say is that our study results are applicable to the people, uh, the regions from which we have uh, selected the people from. And uh, I think we still have a few minutes left, so I would like to open it up for questions. Just a reminder, muting will remain on but you can enter your questions into in the question and answer box. And one of us will try to uh, answer those questions. And I, uh, some of us answered some of your questions already as we were seeing, and hopefully we haven't missed many, but if you have any questions, please type it in. And uh, Verena, myself, uh, uh, Brent or Vanessa uh, and Tina could take on uh, any one of those questions. I'm trying to see. Parminder, you, sorry. Sorry, Parminder, it's Jennifer. If no questions come up, you could talk about um, anything about uh, impact, because there were a few questions about like impact in the community on the results of the study. But I see some coming in now. OK. Uh, first of all, there was a question about the blood samples that you send during the uh, COVID, the drop of the blood. We are not using that blood to do the studies that Brent was talking. The blood collection that we collected from our participants, then they come to our data collection site and we need a large amount of blood to be able to do these studies. And that's the blood that was used. The, the blood that we received through uh, during the COVID, which was a drop of blood that was only used to do the antibody studies. Um, and some of the questions are related to scientific publications. You can go to our website and many of those are listed there. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm going to be, um, I'm following all the questions, but if anybody has seen other questions. Uh, so so there was a question this, about if I see a day, if we see somebody with that risk, are those, uh, that is that information passed on to my family doctor? We don't do that because we don't have the consent to contact your family doctors. In some cases, uh, if there is a clinically relevant thing we see, and with the consultation with our study physicians, we will contact you and you can provide that information to your doctor, or you can give us the permission to contact them at that time. Tina, you have your hand up. 
Yes, I just wanted to respond to a question uh, in the question and answer about the study is, is going for 10 years and is there a plan for it to go longer? I think I'll give the, I'll give the facetious answer. We hope so. Uh, but I have to tell you that there's a lot of discussion going on now. Uh, how can we continue this study to, to go on for longer than 10 years? So I think in our most recent writings, we say that it's at least 20 years. The other challenge we have is if the study does end in 2033, we have to figure out a way to securely store and manage the information that's been collected from all of you. So this is a topic uh, of conversations. So I don't know if Parminder wanted to add something to that, but we're seriously thinking about this. No. And there was a question from Mike about how does the CLSA population compare to the Canadian population in terms of education? A very good question. Uh, even when we were selecting people, we knew that we were getting people, fewer people in the low education groups. And the, as part of the design of the CLSA, we went to uh, some of the uh, dissemination area based on Statistics Canada data and oversample people from the low education uh, areas uh, to make sure that we have a large enough number so we can do meaningful analysis that are applicable to, to those uh, groups of people. And we have compared our data with the census data. Uh, generally, we and with the, some of the Statistics Canada surveys that are population-based representative some surveys, we do very well, but we do have uh, by few percentages, lower people in our low education and low income groups. And that is the nature of many of these uh, studies because people from low income, uh, low education groups generally uh, less likely to participate. However, we have worked with Statistics Canada to develop these statistical strategies to make our data more generalizable to the population by creating some weights that, that one person from that low income group can represent uh, 20 people. And uh, so we are using those strategies to see how we can make our data generalizable to the target population from which we se selected our individuals. Um, is there anything else, Tina, you want to take on or others from the group? Uh, okay, unmute. Uh, someone asked if there are similar studies conducted in other countries, and the answer to that is yes. And we are, and from the from the very beginning of planning the study, we've been in communication with most of them to try and ensure that, that what we're collecting is comparable with what they're collecting. So just to say, yes, we're completely aware of the other studies. But we are very proud of the fact that our study is one of the largest and most comprehensive of all the aging studies around the world. So Brent, there was a question, I'm interested in metabolites and how they may bring about high blood pressure increase in cholesterol and so on and so forth. Do you want to tackle that question? Yes, for sure. Um, yes, yeah, so um, metabolites absolutely can influence risk of high blood pressure. They can also influence risk of type two diabetes and obesity. Um, we have published on this and we have identified some metabolites that we believe are causal for cardiometabolic disease outcomes. Um, the publication, I believe, is on the CLSA website. Um, the last author's name is Chen and it's published in Nature Genetics. Um, but that outlines some of those uh, metabolite risk factors for cardiometabolic diseases. And if you send out the email to us, we can send you that publication that... Uh... Uh, Brent was mentioning on that particular topic. So there was a question about, I'm thinking of diseases like schizophrenia rather than mental health. Mm. Uh, I, I think some of the diseases that uh, are very rare, mm. you probably need way more than 50,000 people to be able to look at them. And schizophrenia would be one of those diseases that CLSA might not have enough numbers. Secondly, uh, people uh, might likely to not uh, participate in studies such as CLSA or stay in the studies uh, such as CLSA. So those studies have to be designed very differently to capture 
uh, people with those uh, uh, neurological conditions such as schizophrenia. Uh, there was a question. I'm interested in the fact that partners are not interviewed. Data is being collected on what you are being told by the participant without cross-reference. Uh, that's a good question. We well, debated quite a bit at the outset um, uh, whether we can we should have uh, both partners collect data uh, for multiple reasons. Some of them were scientific and some of them were logistic reasons that we decided that we were going to include one person from a household. Uh, I, I don't know of any study that verifies questions across uh, partners in relation to what is being answered. And we are in many types, times interested in your perception of your health rather than by someone else. Uh, but as you know, many of you have given your healthcare numbers to us with your consent. And we use those numbers to, with your permission, link it with the healthcare registries data. So we can actually cross reference with your medical data to see uh, what actually is going on in relation to uh, health related factors at least. Tina, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, I don't think so. I mm -hmm. think, I, I mean, I just want to say that how humbling it is to, to have so many of you coming to this webinar and uh, asking your questions, which we're, we're scrambling to try and answer. And we will be, be, we've got all of these recorded. So we hope that we can bundle some of the answers to these questions and uh, circulate uh, them to you. But I'm, I'm just blown away. This has been a wonderful experience. I've learned a lot too. Mm -hmm. So thank There you. was a one quick question. Was there an outcome that was surprising to the research team? Uh, to me, at least, we did a, a baseline report for the CLSA. It was it was widely uh, publicized, and we did it for the Public Health Agency of Canada. And that goes back to the question that Verena was talking about: um, whether are you lonely when if you're married versus when you're living alone? And the question that surprised me, and we I'm not sure how much that question has been delved into was that around 20 or 18% of the married women reported being lonely. And, uh, and that was an interesting finding. And, and I think it needs further exploration that you could be in a marital relationship and still feel lonely. So loneliness is not just because you live alone. It could happen in, for multiple other reasons as well. Verena, you want to tackle that one and further on that one or no? Yeah, that is a really good example of exactly the difference between social isolation and loneliness. So you can be lonely in a crowd. You can be lonely in a spousal relationship. It depends on the quality of the relationship. And there was a question from uh, Philip Bartlett that I briefly addressed about uh, spousal relationships. We do not have questions around that. Oh, I wish we did. I really wish we had more questions. But as you all know, you're answering already so many questions. And thanks so much for doing that. And we all would like to add more questions, but there's only so much time you can give us. Um, there was another question. I think we had around 1800 people registered for the webinar. And I saw around 500 people who were active on the webinar today. And, uh, and this was only targeted for our participants in Manitoba, Ontario, and Quebec. And uh, so I, I don't know what percentage of the participants that would be who attended today. We'll have to do those calculations later. Um, but, but we are very encouraged to see this much interest in the middle of the day. Uh, from many of you in relation to the CMSA. Um, and the, any of these presentations will be available online. Yes, we usually have our web seminars uh, posted on our uh, websites. Um, I think uh, I think we have to, we have uh, come to the end of uh, our webinar. We have gone a little longer than planned. So again, I want to thank you all of you for attending today and asking really insightful questions. And, uh, and uh, we hope you will continue to participate in the CLSA and, 
and uh, participate in many of the sub studies that we are uh, including to enrich our data to answer very important questions. And somebody had asked this question earlier on, the, uh, is the goal is to extend the life. Actually, that's not the goal of the CLSA. CLSA's goal is to keep people healthy as long as possible rather than just extending life. So it is about health span. Uh, and and if uh, and and that's what most of our research is trying to achieve. So thank you again. Thank you to the all the speakers. They did a wonderful job, and I learned a lot as well from each one of you. 